If you have a Bible, uh, let's turn to Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. And uh, we're, we've been working our way through the Lord's uh, Prayer. I want to read the uh, beginning at verse uh, uh, 9 this time. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 9. Uh, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We've come, as you know, uh, to uh, what is uh, the last petition in this uh, very um, known prayer. Uh, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil Uh, One, and uh, as you know from uh, previous weeks, uh, we we pray each of these last petitions. Um, What's the motivation? Why do you pray? Give us this day our daily bread. Why do you pray? Forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Why do you pray? Lead us not into temptation. We pray these things so that God's will might be done on earth as as it's done in heaven. We pray these last petitions so that God's kingdom would come. We pray these last petitions so that God's name would be glorified. And the relationship that we have with him as children, with the Father, and the relationship we have with one another as a family might be enjoyed. There's your motivations. That's why we pray for these things. Um, We ask in order that the will, that the kingdom, that the name of God might come, be glorified. Um, and forgiveness uh, we talked about forgiveness last week and God is very ready he's more ready to forgive your sins than you are ready to confess them remember the parable of the prodigal son and the father was waiting for the son he saw him at a distance he was waiting for his return He was waiting to run and embrace him and kiss him and demonstrate that he loved him and affirmed his love to him. That God is more ready to forgive our sin than we are ready to confess our sin. At the same time, even though that grace is true and even though that mercy of God is there for us, uh, we don't use forgiveness as a Uh, We don't take advantage of God's grace. We don't abuse God's grace. We don't misuse God's grace. Just because he forgives our sin, just because he's willing to forgive our sin, we don't live in a careless way. But 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 we ask God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil and from the evil one. We don't live carelessly. We don't live thoughtlessly but we live on purpose and for God's purposes. Um, what we are uh, asking for is, is that we would not be lazy-minded. This, this, this prayer for leading us not into temptation and delivering us from evil is a, is a prayer that we would be diligent It's a prayer that we would have an attitude of gratitude, right? Not an attitude of latitude. You know what latitude is? It means that there's freedom from restriction. You just do what you want to do because God's going to forgive my sin anyway. That's the wrong attitude. That's not the attitude of someone who's been born again. But but, but if you've been born again, if you really have tasted the heavenly gift, if you have received the Spirit of God, if you've been bathed in the blood of Jesus and, and clothed in his righteousness, there is a gratitude that should, that should spring up within us. 
that this is the God who has loved me. This is the God who has died for my sin and has been raised to give me a brand new life. Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do it, whatever it is. I'm ready. Here I am. Remember Isaiah? He was cleansed. Here I am. Send me. This is the attitude. Remember Paul? The love of Christ controls me because I'm convinced he died. So I live every moment for the one who died and was raised again on my behalf. See, this is the attitude of the person who's been born again. It's not this lazy whatever attitude. It's an attitude of diligence to do uh, the will of God. And so we are really asking when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we are asking God uh, to lead us into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Remember Psalm 23? Lead us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And we're also asking uh, God uh, to lead us into, into fellowship with his people. Uh, because there in the fellowship of God's people, the true fellowship of God's people, uh, there is encouragement. There is an urging, exhortation to, to stick with Jesus. Don't give up on him. That's part of the reason we come and listen to to sermons and, and, and have time in, in, in Sunday school and just time around the meal to fellowship and, and to encourage one another. Fellowship means to share with each other what God is doing and who God is so that we might be uh, spurred on, encouraged to follow him. And that's what we're asking for in this, in this petition. Um, we're asking for a, an experience of, of victory in Jesus Christ. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. We're asking for victory. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. How does God do it? How does God lead us? How does he direct us uh, to depend on him? And how does God um, uh, direct us to depend on him? And how does God deliver us to delight in him? Lead us not into temptation. You, you know this. Um, Mr. Rogers read this. Do you believe this? It is impossible for you to ever be tempted beyond what you are able to deal with. God will never allow his people to be tempted beyond their ability. He will never do it. Do you believe that? The Bible says that God is faithful to you. He's faithful. He will protect you. He will never permit you to be tempted above your ability. If he knows you can only hold 10 pounds, he won't give you an ounce more to carry. He will never allow it. He sovereignly watches. Satan's a lion. Satan's on a leash. Satan is on a leash. God's got a leash. And he can only go but so far. There is no temptation that has taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful. He will never allow you to be tempted above what you are able to deal with. But he will always provide for you a way to escape. He will always do that. He faithfully protects. He faithfully provides when you are going through the tide. God never tempts anyone to sin. The Bible says that in the book of James, chapter 1. Read the chapter. You'll find it. God cannot be tempted with sin. He never tempts anyone to sin. Satan is the enemy. It's the world, right? The flesh and the devil. They're your enemies. The world we live in is fallen. There's all kinds of distractions around that, that call you away from God. There's one of your enemies. The flesh, inside of your own heart, your own lust, entice you to turn away from God. There's your second enemy. The devil. He's like a ferocious lion going to and fro, seeking someone to devour. He's looking for a piece of bleeding meat that's disconnected from the body. There's your third enemy. And the last enemy is death. And his day is coming too. 
But they're your enemies. And it's true, is it not? God, uh, God often leads you to a place where you do get tempted by the devil. Isn't that right? Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for the express purpose of being tempted by the devil. In the book of Luke, it says that he was full of the Spirit, and the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. The book of Mark says that Jesus was thrown in the wilderness for the specific purpose of being tempted by the devil, being tried by the devil, being tested. It's said about God's people, too, all throughout the Old Testament. It says, you read it in Exodus chapter 15, verse 25, it says that God tested his people. In chapter 16, verse 4, he tested his people. He wanted to know what was in their hearts. He knew, but he wanted them to know that he knew what was in their heart. You know, we can all talk the talk, right? I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I trust in God. But what do you do in private? It's easy to say that in public. What do you do when the heat is on? What do you do when the pressure's on? Do you run to Jesus? Or do you run to a bottle? Or do you run to porn? Or do you start getting angry with God and start blaming God when you put on a happy face and act like everything's okay? Who you and I are under pressure is who we really are. You don't know that an orange is really an orange until you smash it and you get orange juice. They got this phony fruit today. It, it looks like an orange. It even smells like an orange. It, it's got the wave of an orange. But when you smash it, it's nothing in there but feathers. But, but if, if you want to really test to see if it's a real orange, you cut it and see what happens. You want to see if someone's a real Christian? Put them under pressure. What comes out of their mouth? Get you in the middle of traffic, and you're late for work. And you know you're late for work, and you're going to be late for work, and you know this is the third time, and your boss is going to be waiting for you. What comes out of your mouth in the middle of traffic? Are they prayers, or are they curses for the people in front of you? Right? Get in an argument with your wife. What comes out of your mouth? You see, who we are under pressure is who we really are. That's a, that's, a, that's a far more accurate description of who we really are. Um, it's easy to put on a happy face in public. We can do it. We do it so well. We're all actors. But what happens when the heat's on? And oftentimes God did that. Read Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. He says that he made his people hungry. He made them thirsty. He humbled them to know what was in their heart, whether they would do what he told him to do. And so God, God tests us, and he often puts us in a place where we will be tempted. And it's not only to expose what's in our heart, but it's also to shape our character. God wants us to be more like Jesus, and when we're under trial, the Bible says suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance builds character in us. And it's not just to produce character, it's to equip us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Bible says that God comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we might be able to comfort other people in any afflictions that they have with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. And so when you're going through trial and when you're going through temptation, God put a work order out on you. He's got ministry in mind for you. The reason you're going through a trial is because God wants you to bring your trial to him so he can equip you with his comfort and then commission you to comfort somebody else. And that's what's going on. And sometimes we get to blaming God. And why is this happening to me? Why isn't it happening to you? You're just like everybody else. You know, and so, so we, we go through trials, we go through troubles because God wants to give us equipment so that we can better serve him. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 to 7. You see that there. And not only that, but God, God, God takes us through trials sometimes because he wants us to depend on him. 
We get used to depending on ourselves so much, right? It's easy to depend on yourself. And, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says in verse 8 and 11, 8 through 11, that, that Paul felt that he had received the sentence of death. He said it was all over for us. But then, he, but then after, as he went through this experience, he said that all of this happened for, for what reason? So that, so that we would depend not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. That's why he went through the trouble, is so that God would teach him and train him, depend on me, not on yourself. And then in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, what does it say? You know the passage that Paul received this thorn in the flesh, and he pleaded with God three times, take it away, take it away, take it away. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to take it away, but I want you to know how sufficient my grace is, how perfect my power is in the midst of your weakness. And so Paul said, God is doing something. When we go through trials, when we go through difficulties, God is doing something. Jesus Christ is at work teaching us, depend on me. When you go through trials, Jesus is saying, see how sufficient my grace is. See how sufficient my power is. Because at the end of the day, what Jesus is after is glory. He wants his people worshiping him. He wants his people honoring him, giving praises to him, giving worship to him, because he's worthy of that kind of attention. He's worthy of that kind of repeated mention, because Jesus is God Almighty, and he loves us. And so God is not out to get you. He's out to grow you. And um, so he leads us. He directs us to depend on him. And he also does it to encourage community. There's no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. Common to man. You know, you, you and I are not allowed to say, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. We're not allowed to sing that song. Because temptations and trials are common to man. You know, there's somebody else going through the same thing. It says that in 1 Peter chapter 5, your brothers are suffering the same way you are. So be encouraged by that communal suffering. And know that the same God who's helping them is the God who's going to help you. Jesus was driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And um, we learn so much from what Jesus went through. But, but one point I want us to focus on uh, is that, that Jesus Christ, the Bible says in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, it says he suffered being tempted. And he comes to help those who are being tempted. Do you believe that? That when you're tempted, Jesus knows what you're going through. And he has committed himself to coming to you and helping you through your temptation. The Bible says it was read, Mr. Rogers read this as well, in, in, in Hebrews chapter 4. We have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of the living God. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we have been yet without sin. Jesus knows all about it. You know, Jesus was never hit by a car. He was never in an accident. You know, he didn't have cars back then. Um, he didn't have cancer. Um, but he doesn't have to have every single scenario that you have. Because what's true of Jesus is that, is that Jesus had the worst possible circumstances of all. Right? Every single thing that Satan could do, he did do to Jesus. That's not true of you and me. But Jesus felt the full arsenal of Satan, and he didn't flinch once. He never compromised. He never sinned. And so he knows what it's like to deal with the whole weight of Satan's arsenal. And he never flinched. Not only that, but even more than that, that, that Jesus dealt with the wrath of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the worst thing in the world possible is for God to turn his back on you and forsake you and to be punished by God and to absorb the wrath of God into your own body. Jesus dealt with that. It doesn't get any worse than that. And so Jesus has been at ground zero, friend. He's been in the worst place of all. 
And he never doubted. He never sinned. He never compromised. And so anything you bring to him, whatever you bring to him, everything you bring to him, he can handle it. He can walk you through it. He can deal with it. Um, I'm sure you can, you, can say, you can tell the same story that I can, but, but that, those, those truths, you, you, you don't know how much junk those things have got me through. Just a realization of those realities. And I'm sure you can, you can say the same thing. Jesus has been there. He's done that. Um, and so this leads us, you know, what, what's the end of that verse as, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16? Let us therefore boldly come to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. One of the, one of the, the, the most key things about dealing with temptation and, and experience deliverance from temptation, and, and it's, it's one of the first things we forget about, it, it's prayer. It's prayer. Prayer is an absolute key to handling any kind of temptation. Um, remember, remember what it says about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries, with loud tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because he submitted himself reverently to God. Sometimes it's the one thing that we don't do when we're tempted is we just don't pray. And um, uh, we don't feel like praying. We're tired. Uh, we're sick of praying. We've tried praying. And um, it doesn't seem like it's working. Well, the Bible says you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. If you stop praying, that means you're not searching with all of your heart. If you say, I tried prayer, that means you stopped prayer, right? Uh, God made a promise to Abraham. He said, I'm going to give you a seed. He was 75 years old. He didn't get it until he was 100. 25 years the man was praying. The temptation you're going through, have you prayed for it 25 years? Even if you have, so what? Keep on praying, right? Don't stop praying. Jesus was in Gethsemane. This is where we began our series on prayer and he, he prayed to God. He cried out to God. And he told his disciples at least two times, Rise and pray, lest you fall into temptation. When you get on your knees and you cry out to God, you don't even have to be on your knees. You know, you close your eyes in prayer. You're driving along. You can pray. Don't close your eyes when you drive, though. That's, that's putting God to the test. Um, but, but when, you, when you pray to God, no matter where you are, you can pray. You can cry out to God, right? You don't have to be a special place to pray. Back in the Old Testament, you had to really be in Jerusalem to, to do it right. You know, you had to go to the temple to do it right. You had to go talk to the priest, and you had to bring some cattle with you, and you had to lay your hands on the cattle. You had to do all this ceremony stuff. But now, wherever you are, you can just cry out to God. And he hears. He hears the prayers of his people. And so, so, so I encourage you strongly, pray, don't stop praying. It says we have confidence to draw near to the throne of grace. It's a throne of grace. It's a throne. God is ruling. He's in charge of everything. He's sovereign. It's a throne you're coming to. It's the throne of God. And it's a throne of grace. It's a throne of mercy. And you can appeal to God on the blood of Jesus. It says we have confidence to draw near through the blood of Christ. Sometimes you don't pray because you feel unworthy. You feel guilty. Well, so what? Deal with it. Get over it. Take your guilt to Calvary. Confess your sin and cry out to God. And He will forgive you. Won't He? Didn't He say He would? He doesn't lie. You cry out to God. Draw near to Him. How do we sing it? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Never. 
you, believer in Jesus, should never be discouraged to pray. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can you find a friend so faithful who all your sorrows will share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. It's the biggest problem in churches today. One of the biggest problems is getting people to fill a prayer meeting very hard to do. People stop believing. They just don't believe in prayer anymore. They don't believe it works. They don't believe. What's the point? When Jesus was tempted, he trusted God's character. The Bible says he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. When Jesus was tempted, he trusted in God's competency. He knew that God could deliver him from death, and so he cried out to him. When Jesus was tempted, he trusted in God's commands. You read Matthew 4 in your spare time, and you see how Jesus dealt with temptation. Every time Satan came to him, he answered with the word of God. He answered what he knew to be true about God's character and about God's ways, and that's how he got through. You know, those, in those temptations of, of Jesus, they, they mirror the temptations that were found in Israel in the Old, in the Old Testament. You read your Old Testament and you see the three things that, that Satan pinpoints. Has God really led you? Has God really led you? And is God really loyal to you? And does God really love you? You read it, that's what he's after. That God has led his people, he is leading his people, he promised to do that, he gave the spirit to that end. He is loyal to you, he's faithful always to you, and he loves you with an everlasting love. And uh, we talked in Sunday school today about Satan and the way he goes about <clears throat> tempting us. And one of the things that you see in Genesis 3, the first temptation, one of the things that you see, you read that verse, you read those chapters very carefully. In chapter 2, God always says, Lord God. He mentions his covenant name. Right after they fall into sin, God mentions his covenant name. But all the time Satan is talking to them, the covenant name does not appear. Because Satan's primary purpose is to get you away from thinking about God's grace, his goodness, his faithfulness, his mercy, his covenant love and devotion for you. If he can get you from thinking about those things, he can get you. Because it's the love of God and the mercy of God that motivates us to love God. And if he can get your mind distracted from the love of God, he's got you. And he can do all kinds of things with you. But when you're established in the love of God and you're established in the grace of God and you're filled with the knowledge of the mercy of God and the wonder of God and how great God is, it's very difficult for Satan to get next to you. Because if you're filled with those things, you're also filled with worship. You're also filled with praise. You're also filled with prayers. And Satan doesn't like to be around people who pray sincerely. And Satan doesn't like to be next to people who worship God from a true heart. He has no desire for those things. The Bible says, humble yourself. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Do you believe that? If you humble yourself, if you worship God with a true heart, if you cry out to God, like you really mean it, like you really believe God's going to listen to you. The Bible says that's what it means to humble yourself and Satan will flee from you. He'll be back, but you know how to make him flee again. Take him to the cross. Tell him what Jesus did for you. Worship God. The Bible says every time we experience temptation, it's common to man. And we are told... Uh, in the book of Hebrews, it says, see to it, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, isn't it? See to it that there's not in any of you a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. We're told to examine one another. We don't like to be examined. How many people just love to go to the doctor? It says, see to it that there's not in any of you a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. We're called to examine one another. How, do, how are you going to see to it? But exhort one another every day. Urge people daily not to turn away from God. And it says to do that, to establish, to establish one another. It says 
in chapter 3, verse 13, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin so that you don't get hardened by sin. You and I need examination. You and I need self-examination and examination from one another. And there's a context to do that in a way that's appropriate. But, but there, there, and there's, there's also a need for this exhortation. We need daily exhortation to stick with Jesus. There's all kinds of stuff in this world to distract you and to disturb your faith and to drive you away from God. And you and I need daily urging. We need someone in our life, someone's in our life. We need to be in one another's lives, telling one another to stick with Jesus. He's really the real article. He won't drop you. He won't deny you. He won't turn his back on you. He stands for you. He intercedes for you. He always lives to pray for you. He's preparing a place for you. He's always up to something good for you. We need that kind of urging because our hearts always are so easily influenced by the world we live in, by the flesh we have, by the devil who tempts us. <clears throat> The Bible says that we're to, to overcome evil, deliver us from evil, or the evil one. And we're supposed to overcome evil. The Bible says you bless people who persecute you. You bless them. You don't curse them. Right? You never take vengeance, it says. But you leave it to the wrath of God. Vengeance is God's property. I will repay is his promise. And so, so when the Bible says to pray for those who mistreat you, it means what it says. You know, if, you, if someone starts a fire with you and you bring more fire, you both get burnt. But you overcome evil with good. When your enemy hurts you, you pray for them. When they bless you, you, when they curse you, you bless them. When they do something evil, the Bible says that you do something kind to the people who do something evil to you. It's so easy when someone hurts you for you to hurt them. That's automatic. You know, when I was growing up, if somebody called you a name, the first response that we gave was your mother. Someone call you stupid, your mama. You know, we talk about people's mother, then, we, then they talk about my mother, and then we, we go back, back at it, and before you know it, we're on the ground scuffling. You know? And, oh, these are Christians. <laughs> You're right. You know, let your light so shine as you knock out your brother's tooth, you know? Um, before a minute, they may see you're good, you're right? It's not happening. So, so you overcome evil with good. Repay no one, the Bible says, evil for evil. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing this, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. This is how, this is how God did it for us, isn't it? The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 6, it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for the righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. God has shown you the love. He's shown you the way. The love of God is inside of you. The Spirit of God is inside of you. You've got the power of the living God inside of you to love your enemies. You were an enemy. God loved you, reconciled you. So go love, overcome evil with good, right? It's the Christian way. It's what separates believers from unbelievers, actually. And then, uh, lastly, uh, we're told to overcome uh, the evil one. It's, it's implied as well. And you know that this day we celebrate how Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey. 
He didn't come on a war horse. He wasn't coming to, 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 to sack the place. He wasn't coming to destroy lives. He, he was coming to save lives. He, he came on an animal that represents peace, right? He came on a donkey. He came, the Bible says, bringing righteousness, his own righteousness to give to you and I as a gift. He came, it says, bringing salvation. He came to die on a cross and to lay down there so all of your sin and all of your shame and all of your rebellion and all of your perversions and all of your immoralities might be laid on him, that he might become sin, that he might suffer the judgment and the punishment for you and I. He came into Jerusalem to bring peace, to bring righteousness, to bring salvation. And he did it. He actually did it. He accomplished his mission. He cried out on the cross, it's finished. It's paid in full. He actually did it. And not only that, the Bible says he comes and speaks peace to the nations. You know how he does that today? He does it through you and me. The church of Jesus Christ. It's the place where Jesus is. It's the temple of the new covenant. It's the place where Jesus commissions his people to leave this place and go into this world and announce peace to the nations. That there is a God who sent his son that shed his blood and was raised from the dead so that you might have peace with God and the peace of God and peace among people. So you and I have been given the, the tall charge of, of announcing peace to the nations, announcing salvation to the nations. And the Bible says that, that when you do that, what Jesus is doing as you do that is he's extending his rule from sea to sea. You read it in Zechariah chapter 9. He's extending his reign over the whole earth. Here's the one thing that, that Satan can't stop is the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the onslaught of the church of Jesus Christ. No, they won't. Jesus is winning and he will win. He's victorious. He's already reigning. From sea to sea, the Bible says in Revelation 20 that Satan has already been bound by Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection bound him so that he would no longer deceive the nations. You ever wonder in the Old Testament, there's all these Jewish people who believe in the true God. There's hardly any Gentiles. But after Pentecost, all these Gentiles start coming in. They're no longer deceived. That's why you and I are seated here is because Satan has been bound. He cannot deceive the nations. Oh yeah, he does his work. He goes from to and fro seeking someone to devour. But the gospel stops him. You ever see someone who's lost, believing in Satan, trusting in Satan, and all of a sudden they hear the good news about Jesus, and boom, it hits. They become saved. They've been taken out of Satan's, out of Satan's charge, out of his hands. They're no longer his captive. They're now Jesus' captive. And so you and I have been given that charge to extend the reign of God across the earth through the gospel, through prayerful proclamation of the gospel. You overcome evil. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. Let's pray. Our Father, in Christ's name, we do come and we give thanks to you. For your goodness, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for his grace and for his power. And Father, you have said to us in your word, um, that you, you do mighty things through your people. You do immeasurably more than anything we could ask or possibly imagine according to your power at work within us. We thank you and we praise you, dear God. Um, we want to just skip our...